Here's what's coming up in episode 196 from the cast of Hocus Pocus, Larry Bagby. It's an honor. I so appreciate what this movie has become. One of my favorite parts when they say, we need one child. And we both point to each other and we go, him. And now you can imagine I was a church going boy (laughs) having to go to church with dyed black hair and the word ice shaved in the back of my head. I have people talking. I can just tell you that. See us for compassion. See us for charity. Well, see us for the center, the core of you and me. Well, love is what connects us. They also had me smoking in the original script. Since then, man, I smoked the hell. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> now I can't stop smoking. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance in the last episode i had a delightful interview with david kirshner the creator writer and producer of hocus pocus and he's also the executive producer of the upcoming hocus pocus 2 if you missed that episode it is required listening well we're gonna continue our hocus pocus theme this week y'all because i love it And I know you do, too. In the 1993 film, Larry Bagby played Ernie, who famously preferred to refer to himself as Ice. You'll remember that Max Dennison first met Ice in a cemetery on his way home, along with Ice's buddy and partner in crime, Jay. What I think is funny is that it's hard to tell just which one of these guys was the sidekick, so... Maybe we'll hear about that a little later. In the film, Ice steals Max's shoes and later his candy. And by the end, Ice and Jay end up being captured and tortured by the Sanderson sisters. I am so fortunate to have Mr. Larry Bagby in the parlor with me today. With his many high-profile acting roles, you've already seen the acting talents of Larry in TV and film. He is internationally known for his all-American and guy-next-door characters, as well as his comedic and dramatic roles. Along with Hocus Pocus, his long list of credits include the supporting role as Marshall Grant in the award-winning film Walk the Line, and as Cheryl Kendrick in the war drama Saints and Soldiers. He's appeared in many TV shows, such as HBO's Ray Donovan, Fox hit TV show 911, CBS longtime series NCIS, The Young and the Restless, Jag, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and if Wikipedia is correct, even all the way back to Mr. Belvedere, y'all. Larry's true passion has been and remains as a musician. He is a gifted songwriter and has a musical style that is uniquely his own yet is equal to the star power of today's country music scene. His original songs have been featured in the films The Day the Earth Stood Still and in the title track of The Breakup Artist. Bagby sang Counting My Lucky Stars alongside Tim McGraw's music in the CBS hit show Cold Case Files. An in-demand live entertainer, Larry Bagby has opened for Glenn Campbell, Luke Bryan, Hunter Hayes, Joe Diffie, Hal Ketchum, Pat Green, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, and even the Kevin Bacon Brothers. He has performed alongside members of Johnny Cash's Tennessee Three and many other notable bands. With his many exceptional talents, expect to see more of the actor on screen 
as well as the musician on stage for years to come. You can find his website at LarryBagby.com. Welcome to the big seance, Larry. Oh, that was good, man. I feel so good now. I feel like I'm at my own funeral. That <laughs> well, that's what we go for here. Beautiful, beautiful eulogy. I love it. And, and we're cool with funerals here, too. That's just w- the right weirdness right up our alley. That's hey, fine. Ghost, man. If you don't die, there's no ghost. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just a bunch of hocus pocus. Good. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. That kind of is a foreshadowing to a question I have for you coming up. Mm-hmm. I've heard the show. I've heard the show. <laughs> One of the reasons I wanted to hit your bio hard is because we need to make it clear that even though we're going to focus obviously on the enormous nerd fest that is hocus pocus, <laughs> your work and resume is so much more than hocus pocus. Does it ever? Does it ever bother you when you're recognized for your role as ICE or, or do you love it? I love it. You know, it's, it's an honor. I so appreciate what this movie has become. It's kind of the, uh, you know, the hero story of, of this film that nobody really knew about or cared about. Low budget compared to the, what the rest of the movies that they were making at the time. And um, a lot of unknown cast and then some cast members that were coming back kind of making a, a splash again in, in their own right with Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker, Kathy Nae Jimmy, and then all those crazy kids. <laughs> yeah. So, no, it doesn't bother me at all. In, in fact, I, I enjoy it. And um, we're doing uh, some Comic-Con type fests finally coming out of, the, out of the cobwebs here. And we have our first one coming up in Texas, San Antonio, the big Texas Comic-Con. Yeah, that's uh, October 7th through the 10th. And that's going to be fun. And then we're doing one in Florida, which is a new one called uh, Mouse Expo. And it's some Disney stars. And we're doing that in Orlando, Florida. And so that's the 27th through the 29th of uh, February in Orlando. I'm going to go to Disney World. So you're not afraid to hang out with the nerds then? No, I'm a nerd. (laughs) Nice. I, I grew up wanting to be. In the movies, because I love the movies, you know, yeah. one of my favorite movies that influenced me as an actor and made me want to make films, but also just uh, be a part of the industry was Back to the Future. I saw that like <gasps> 10 times in the theater. I just couldn't yeah. get enough of that film. And, you know, we all know why that film, it's just like the perfect film. Yeah. And then Star Wars, of course, mm-hmm. I'm a total Star Wars geek. And, and then in music, the Beatles, you know. <laughs> so I, I I love it, and it's pop culture, and, and I'm glad I got to play a part of uh, a little bit of a pop culture that people can enjoy and we can talk about. And yeah, it's nostal- nostalgic for me too. How old were you when you filmed Hocus Pocus? Good question. I think when I booked it, because it took a minute before we started shooting, it would have been ninety two, I believe. So I just graduated high school, so I was seventeen, coming up on eighteen. You know, we joke about how you guys were kids, but you were an older kid. And through the eyes of a high school graduate, you probably were looking at the world a little differently then. So it's interesting. Was it the biggest thing you had done at that time? Uh, Yeah, it definitely was. And, you know, I started and I'd been doing it for, I guess, since I was about 12 years old. So I'd done some films, Mr. Belvedere. I I was on that, believe it or not. And that was one of my first uh, big TV yeah. Guest star roles. And I was also a bully <laughs> and I had a sidekick or I was a sidekick, like you're saying, to uh, Seth Green. Did you know that your name was also Ernie in Mr. Belvedere, which is funny? I, I That is funny. I must play, you know, Ernie's and, <laughs> and even my own name. I've played Larry before and, uh-huh. and Buffy. I was Larry. But uh, yeah. And that was with Seth Green. It was the first of three times that I worked with him because we worked on Airborne together and then uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And then, yeah, so that was the biggest film Mm -hmm. to date, you know, with pretty big stars and 
I just, after hearing David talking about how, you know, the movie was released in the summer, which is kind of a weird time to release it. And it didn't really create the waves at the beginning that people hoped it would. Did you realize that at the time? Was it kind of a bummer for you or was it just all cool the whole time? No, you know, I don't remember it being uh, too big of a disappointment. I was just grateful, you know, to be on the big screen, you know, a, a theatrical release, my first. And and what I guess what made that not so difficult for me was not long after that, I went on a, a mission for my church for two years. Mm-hmm. So I waited a year longer before I went because I'd just done the movie and my agent was like, you can't leave. And like at this point where <laughs> you're, you're on fire, finally, you're gonna- <laughs> yeah, you're like you know, in the league now and you have some opportunities. I said, I'll, I'll stay for a little bit longer, but you know, I knew I wanted to, to go on this mission. And so I left, I guess it was in 94 of April and the movie came out in July of August, 93. So I kind of saw a little bit, but it wasn't in the theaters very long. And I know it was up against Jurassic park, the opening weekend, which was like, come on, get buried. (laughs) I mean, the dinosaurs themselves cost more than probably the whole yeah. movie of Hocus Pocus. <laughs> so anyway, I left. But what was cool was I, I ended up going to Argentina and I found a theater there. I mean, my my companion at the time, we kind of travel in twos, as you know. Yeah. We popped into a, a theater in Argentina, a small theater, and I was translated into Spanish. There was somebody that was saying my I mean my parts had already been translated did they do a good job I was like it wasn't bad it didn't sound like my voice it sounded like a, a, a young Mexican man or something it was, uh-huh. it was a Latino bueno, bueno, is the, you know but I was like oh if they would have just waited till I got back I could have done my own <laughs> Spanish you know because I learned it but anyway that was kind of a surreal experience and you know it, it was kind of helpful to, to have that advantage when we were cruising around nobody knew who we were my companions always dropped the hollywood card and Uh some of these families would stop and listen so but you ended up coming back Uh uh-huh you had that experience which was which was cool i'm sure yeah yeah i wouldn't wouldn't change that experience i really grew up a lot you know you have to kind of a selfless situation coming from such a selfish movie star Uh and you know all you know i was making the best money it probably helps to keep you grounded yeah it definitely did because you know there there was like it was some pretty poor areas Mm -hmm. dirt roads and no air conditioning (laughs) and and sleeping on you know the floor sometimes and so it definitely took a toll on me but but i i learned to let go of me and my needs for theirs for the time being and then I got back and, and started right back up and it seemed to seem to happen again pretty quickly. So I was yeah. grateful for that. Good. I didn't intend on asking this until later on in the interview, but since we're we're on that topic, because I know that your faith is very important to you and because I read somewhere that you carefully considered whether you were going to accept your role on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, for example. Mm-hmm. I wondered what your beliefs were, because, you know, we're all about the paranormal and ghosts and, you know, supernatural here. I wondered what, you know, both what your beliefs were, but also your feelings on the topic of Halloween and the paranormal, since Hocus Pocus is such a Halloweeny film. Yeah, um, you know, Buffy, I thought that was really tastefully done. I mean, the writing's so great. Joss is so great. And I, I have a lot of uh, gay friends and we're all the same, you know, we're all God's children and I don't judge anybody for that. You know, some of my views over the years have become a little less conservative as I've gotten older. I've kind of had to make my own decisions and choices. And, mm-hmm. um, but I'm grateful for the um, foundation that I had because it really helped me focus on family and doing good for others. I think we all know that's the golden rule. Mm -hmm. And Buffy opened a lot of doors for me. And so so I'm glad that I did end up portraying a gay football player. And, uh, you know, Joss was so uh, wonderful. He, I guess initially I had done the first episode, the Halloween episode, believe it or not. Wow. was the first episode I did on Buffy. So I always say I'm kind of a fall guy, like something about (laughs) October and the, the colors. I mean, I look, I got the Browns and the, yellows in my skin and everything 
And look, I love the colors themselves, yeah. the fall colors, even the shirt. But yeah, so there's something about that. I love Halloween. And so now when Hoax Pokes came about, we, you know, those that believe in the paranormal or, or the other side, it's, it's all the same. You know, I've had some interesting, kind of scary in some situations where I definitely felt the presence of not good spirits. And then also I've felt the presence of those that have passed on to the other side, the good spirits. And um, we recently lost my dad in October of last year to COVID. He was a huge part of our lives and really the rock and just the best guy. Everybody loved my dad. He was everybody's bud, you know, didn't judge anybody and had a smile on his face. He was the one that really got us into music and just taught us how to treat a woman because he, he was mm -hmm. good to my mom. Uh, they were married for 50 years. Uh, just a couple of years ago, they had their 50th. But, you know, I've felt his presence quite a bit since he passed. And, and, that, and that to me is, you know, another witness of like, we may die, but we don't go too far away. And, you know, they're still among us, whether we know it or not, <laughs> whether we can see it, if we, if we can believe it and feel it, it's, there's definitely signs, you know. I won't get into any of the details on that, but I love that for you that you've had that experience. Yeah, me too. I didn't, I, I've needed it. Yeah. And I know that my listeners too, that's going to be, that's going to be a question that probably is in their mind as they're listening to this. Well, I wonder if he's had any experiences from his father. So I'm glad yeah. you, you shared that. You said you needed it. I had interrupted you, but you said you needed it. Uh, I have needed it. Yeah. And I'll continue to need it. You know, um, it's happened a few times, in, and especially when I've been out playing music. My brother and I play together as well, and we had a few shows where we don't know exactly, like, if they were long nights and long shows, it felt like, but some of them just, it was like we just got lifted and carried through, and we, on occasion, have heard, like, a third harmony, <gasps> both of us. <laughs> and we're like, Stop that it. sounded way, like, there were more people singing than just us and other people have requested uh, without knowing who, who we are other than just looking at the website or whatever. They found this song that we wrote for my mom, and dad for their anniversary. And, and they read up on, you know, my dad passing and, and they requested that song because it had touched their heart in some way. So we've had some of those kind of moments and, and then just the voices of my father and his smile. I see that, you know, often, and I see the the tracings in the sky and stuff like that. Uh huh. And then also animals, signs, butterflies, dragonflies, eagles, you know, just hummingbirds, all these things. I've read a lot about it and the other side. And, and it's, it's all pretty accurate. Quite a few testimonies of it. That's awesome to hear. Well, you, when you said the third harmony, David, in the last episode, talked about getting chills. I had some straight up chills. I mean, how cool That's is that? The, yeah. The, and those chills, I believe, is, you know, it's the truth. Mm -hmm. When we get that, I do that in music, too, when I'm writing or recording. My friend and I always talk about, we're like, oh, goosebumps, goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're we're doing something right. You know, we hope one way or the other. <laughs> Well, thanks for taking us there where we just went, because my audience loves that kind of thing. Cool. But now that we've been deep, we're going to go back to being goofy for a second. Let's do it. <laughs> hey, man, there's nothing better than a movie that you laugh and cry and hurl. You know, the important stuff. Come on. Here we go. <laughs> so <laughs> who was the sidekick? Was it you or Jay? It was Jay, for sure. I was the leader. <laughs> I'm sure you would hear differently from him. Yeah. Here's what I will tell you. That's that's a funny, funny thing. And Tobias brought this to my attention. We of all the cast members, Tobias and I have hung out most on and off over the years. And like it's busy, but it's always the same. You know, when you have those friends, it picks up and we are the same guys. And we joke around the same way we did when we first got together. And the chemistry is great because we're just different enough to kind of bring some different sides of the humor and approach makes it makes it more interesting for sure. Anyway, he pointed out that while I was on the set, you mentioned you asked how old I was. Yeah. Well, I was 17, but I turned 18 and he was 15 or 16, maybe 16. He turned from 15 to 16. 
And his mom was driving him up from, they grew up in Santa Barbara and she would drive him up. Well, she figured out that she could sign him off and make me Tobias's guardian because I was 18. Stop it. And so I became his guardian. So he didn't have to have him like his mom on set. So we were like <laughs> running around. It's like the blind chasing the blind. It like we were just. You were the leader. You were the bad influence. You. We, I was. Well, outside of the movie, I think in the movie, clearly he's, you know, a little bit sharper and probably more, more of a bully than I am. I'm, I'm just trying to start a rap career or something. <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of those yin and yang things. I think at times. You know, you see that we kind of stand up for each other, but then we sometimes tear each other down. Uh It's like the bullies that fight against each other sometimes instead of against the others. My my favorite line is when Tobias looks at you and and says, you oinker. (laughs) (laughs) I don't feel so good. Probably because you ate too much, you oinker. You oinker. (laughs) (laughs) Or my, my favorite part. One of my favorite parts, it's a real simple thing that happens is when they say, we need one child and we both point to each other and we go, him. <laughs> <laughs> like we're not, we're not giving each other up. Well, speaking of that scene, I need you to unravel the mystery for us. We need to know the truth here because what exactly are dead man's chungs? <laughs> I don't know, but <laughs> somebody brought that to my attention or Actually, I got a, it was a DM or something uh-huh. on Instagram from from a girl that was watching the movie. And she said, my favorite line that you do. And she recorded it and said it to me. Uh, <laughs> Dead man's chungs. I think it might maybe be his balls. I, uh-huh. don't, I don't know. Certainly what I think we're led to believe. I, and that would probably be the worst thing to be having balls chopped off. Excuse me for those middle school kids <laughs> listening. Uh, your nards. Yeah. Uh, how do we say that? Your uh, the boys. I don't know how do you. But it was the, the way you I said mean. it. You were like dead man's chunks. <laughs> Chug. <laughs> oh god. The, the writing was so good in that. You yeah. Know, it was all there. It was all there mostly. We added some. You know, some of that playful baseball. Wah, you know, little uh-huh. ear and all that. I think we added the like the line where we don't know what L.A. is, uh-huh. Los Angeles. Oh, <laughs> like some of the dumb moments. Even though you were probably all from California, right? I know you yeah, were from exactly. California. Yeah. You're like Lower Alabama, <laughs> <laughs> Louisiana. <laughs> uh, you recently got together with Jay for E News. And did, I just saw it recently, actually, and kind of recreated, you know, that famous scene where we get to meet your characters for the first time. And I'm sure it's like, you know, I'm sure you've had this, you know, recreated moment before. But I think for most fans, it was probably the first time they've seen you guys together reenacting that. How did that come about? Well, um, I think that happened. That had to be a couple of years ago now. But they, they contacted us and asked because they do this thing with actors, you know, the reenactment. Yeah. So we went and we went, we got together and studied the scene again. And it, it all came back pretty quickly. And we, we really wanted to make sure that we reenacted it the way that we did it. So we kind of watched it again that way. And then we just went in there. It was so fun. We <laughs> they had costumes ready for us. There was a green screen and we just reenacted it and they shot it. it probably took, you know, maybe an hour, hour and a half. And then they included the other side of Omri uh-huh. or Max, you know, uh-huh. but that was a lot of fun. I think it got quite a few views too. I think people enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, and, and then just the year before is when, as David was talking about, and it was so good to hear him talk about the movie. I had, I really didn't know some of that stuff that he was talking about and, and to get to hear his passion, it makes perfect sense why this movie got made the way it did. And um, he's he's a great guy. Yeah, he's like an adult child, just so excited to talk about it. He is. I, I love it. He was so passionate. Like he was talking about, you know, your passion for this. I'm the same way. I'm like, I feel like just a kid still. You know? Yeah. 
just turned 40, well, 47, coming up on 48. I'm like, oh my gosh, he's a senior citizen. He's like, I know I need to go, but I'm just going to show you this. And then I'm going to show you this. And then I'm going to show like you this. Like kid, like show and tell. And I'm sitting there with my <laughs> eyeballs popping out going, I'm never going to hang up on this. So just keep doing what you're doing. He talked about the free form mm-hmm. ABC Disney um, reunion that we had. And that was the first time we'd all seen each other, some of us in you know 25 years and it was a blast it was so fun to to, and the excitement of the like he said the audience like we had to turn down a couple thousand people and yeah unfortunately it was just packed and the following year we did something similar with the ghostbusters 50th reunion i think it was ghostbusters would probably be 40 40 ish yeah and and then uh the halloween uh haunted house Man, the Haunted Mansion was the 50th year anniversary. And then the Adams Family thing was coming out. And Chris, uh, Aguilera, Christina Aguilera, she performed and some other people. But we went down into the audience and had a, they had another camera on us. And we just sneak up on fans. And Tobias and I would start talking and they'd realize that we're the bullies. And then we then Omri, who played Max, uh-huh. and, and Allison, Vanessa, they came walking up and the kids just were like, oh my gosh, it's all you guys. And, we, and it was so fun to, to see the excitement. And we signed autographs and hung out and talked with some of these people. But that's, that's the beauty of it all. You know, it's yeah. like without the fans, it, it definitely wouldn't be the same experience because it's, it escalates as you get to talk to them about what they liked about it and what kind of nostalgia and how it makes people happy to Mm -hmm. to just have the movie on they watch it year round as comfort you know kind of like me and goonies or et oh yeah yeah back to the future (laughs) since then are you ever in touch with omri i know he's he's kind of gone a different direction with his life you know people change and you know he was a kid just like everybody else in that film but I have so tried to track him down because, he, you know, he was like a giant crush for me. I totally crushed hard on Omri <laughs> Katz. OK, yeah, <laughs> he's a great guy. Still still is still feels the same, you know, when we we're all together. Yeah, um, I think he's I, I think he just, you know, kind of went a different direction and, and got out of the business. Um, and he's been successful in, in other businesses. And he was a hairdresser for a minute and. Um, now I think his major focus is, uh, a weed company Mm -hmm. that, um, grows all their own stuff, but it seems like he's put a lot of passion and hard work into that. He always liked that whole grateful dead, Uh kind of a hippie at heart, you know? And in fact, Kenny bought him tickets to, uh, while we were shooting Uh because he knew he was a grateful dead fan. They went to a concert together with, uh, some of the other production guys. And so Omri, I think he bought himself a VW van you know on the stop on the it. shoot yeah because he was around i think he was around 16 yeah but yeah he's great he just you know he's not into the uh, publicizing i think or yeah. doing interviews as much but he did come out for some of the main the main reunion things the 20th i wasn't able to be there where they had the two screenings at disney that david was talking about i was out of town working on something but the 25th uh, i was there but it so was omri yeah. And he was there the next year for the 26th. And it, it, he's awesome, man. It's still the same. Like I said, all the us kids get together and we just kind of laugh and giggle about the same stuff. <laughs> but we're adults now. <laughs> and and probably just like any kids would do in some kind of reunion. It's just there's just like a Hollywood element added on top of it. Yeah, it's it's really cool. And those and they're all it, it's like I remember having feeling very comfortable, especially being my first big film. Kenny made us all feel so comfortable and he let us play, you know, and try stuff and, and didn't judge us if we did something not right, you know, yeah. we just kind of adjusted and said, try, let's try something different instead of being like, what was that? <laughs> you know? So it, it was perfect. It was a perfect, uh, perfect setting for my first big film. It certainly made me feel uh, really good about what I could do. And, and Tobias, he, he was like total greeny. He came from a, a high school play that they pulled them out of wow. and auditioned for a couple of things. And then he booked Hocus Pocus. So his first job in Hollywood was Hocus Pocus. Tubular. Tubular. <laughs> this is Jay. <laughs> this is Ice. 
And did you, when you got together for E News, did you legit like reshave ice into the back of your head for that? No, good question. (laughs) They, technology is different now. They fixed it in post, but the original, you know, 1990 something, I went to a legit barbershop down off of Wilshire and Sixth, and they did it up, man. It was like they shaved that. And Uh I, had to go back several times because it would grow right back in. Now you can imagine I was a church going boy <laughs> having to go to church with dyed black hair and the word ice shaved in the back of my head. I have people talking. I can just tell you that. That's that's judging funny. me, looking, judging. You had some hard lines on there too, man. Oh, it was dude. trimmed. It was very clear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always joke that if I ever went back, the barber would mess with me and put an L in <laughs> front of the ice. <laughs> or <Cruel>. ice. <laughs> that is cruel. I, I would have chosen N. No, <laughs> anyway. So what were the Halloweens of your childhood like? Or did you, you know, did you celebrate Halloween growing up? Yes. Loved, love, love, love Halloween. Um, still a very cozy holiday. There's something so fun about like, the costumes are always fun and we always enjoyed picking something fun to be and for an actor or someone who's dramatic uh, to get to portray whatever you're wearing, you know, and that's what it's fun about just being an actor. Once sometimes once that costume goes on and makeup goes on, it's uh-huh. like you can, you're like, I'm in now, like I'm no turning back. But Halloween, I've, yeah, I've just loved it. I've always loved the spooky part of it. We always, you know, would try to go to like Knox Scary Farm or the Universal Haunt or haunted houses, you know, up through Utah. When I was growing up, we had all those creepy corn mazes. They do these, you know, out in the middle of, uh-huh. of the hay, like these scary haunted houses or hay rides and and then the candy, come on. And the, you get candy? That's ridiculous. I can just smell it. Like that's nostalgic to me, you know? Oh. Uh, Dude, and then when you got like you got the big candy bars, you're like, oh, those people must be rich. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like full on Hershey bars. And then, we, and then at the end of the night, you get to trade. You're like, I don't really like these you know, candy corns and razor blades. So why not? I'll trade my razor blades for your uh, Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I'll give you my popcorn balls and you can get. <laughs> yeah. And then you get the families that are trying to teach these kids like the dentist who give people <laughs> ap- apples and sugar free gum. Mm-hmm. Like, boo, boo. Yeah. You have to egg their house. Uh-huh. We did do some some toilet papering in our day. So, you know, the scene where we're sitting there and clearly we've been up to no good. The witches come up and, yo, witch, get off my shoe. <laughs> I think initially it was bia- biatch. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, you know, they also had me smoking in the original script, but. Because of my religious convictions, I didn't really feel comfortable. Yeah. Like even holding or faking the cigarette thing. Since then, man, I smoked the hell. No, I'm just kidding. No. Um, <laughs> now I can't stop smoking. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> I got smoke coming out of my ears. Uh, oh, he's God. like the guys that drive these cars and vape. It's like, is that smog or vape? I can't, can't tell. But uh, yeah, they had me smoking. There was more. There was more language. Yeah. But it was it was smart for them to kind of you know because it was already really if you think about it kind of the last edgy Disney mm-hmm. film versus Touchstone, right? Yeah. Because there was kind of language it, it, and it was scary. I mean, there's scary parts and people you know it scares you like fun you know but but still a little bit dark, right? <laughs> well, and there's that whole scene that they that they cut that has more of the darker element of like the, you know, pranks. Oh, I, you know, I've never seen, is that all? Yeah, I haven't even seen Dude, that. Dude, it's, it's on the uh, special features of the, the Blu-ray. Oh, I know there was, there. I have that. I just didn't know there's, it's in the bonus material. Dude, you got to go to the bonus material. <laughs> Dude. And there's a the whole, know my own stuff. and it's like, I see it. And I'm like, this is not even in the, the spirit of Hocus Pocus. It's just like crazy, like, and, and screaming and stuff going on. And I'm like, that's a little, that's a little wild. <laughs> I guess that's the thing, you know, they had to, like, I know, for example, this is an unknown fact, at least. You probably haven't heard this, but I'll tell you because I heard it straight from the horse's mouth. Kenny, 
told us that at one point during the, the screenings, you know, they were testing the audience and wanted to know what, what they liked, what they didn't, they had to cut stuff. So they were like, what if we cut the bullies out of the whole <gasps> film? And it didn't test as well. Like it was something that I don't know what it was. And I'm going to go ahead and say, David, if you're listening, you got to put the bullies back in. Focus <laughs> powers too. I'll do craft services if I have to. Um <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be an extra, okay? I don't care. I just want to see you guys. <laughs> but it was clearly an important element in the story, I, I guess they I found. Guess, and I guess, and, and you know, if you think about it, it's an element that I think it's a bit of a, it's another comic relief in the film that kind of, but it's also the kids get bullied, but then in the end, the witches bully the bullies back. Right. And, and they end up in the cages, like for <laughs> their bad behavior. And then, what was funny in the in the beginning of the very you know the last thing you see is us singing row 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 your boat you yeah, know right. in the credits and they never disclose what happens so you kind of want to know what were they in the cages twenty five years so at the twenty fifth reunion we got back in the cages uh-huh. and the, the show opened with us hanging and they let us out of the cages but anyway I thought that was pretty clever because if you think about it you know that'd be a funny way to to incorporate these guys have grown old and this <laughs> I don't know how we would have survived clearly without <laughs> food or water unless there was somebody coming in to feed us on occasion. Well, I mean, come on, I mean that needs to be in the sequel, but if not, you know, there could always be like there could be a spin-off, you know, like the Conjuring has their whole Annabelle series and the this Ooh. it could be Jay and Ice. Jay and Ice yeah. Take it by storm. <laughs> <laughs> Jane Ice 2, the electric boogaloo. How about that? <laughs> you can appreciate that. I think we're about the same age. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So, like, remember break dancing? Yes. You were probably a little bit younger. I was a little younger, but I loved dancing. But I, like, I would have ended up in the hospital if I tried to do some break <laughs> dancing. You know, just not much I, different than now. <laughs> I hurt my back. I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking the the subtitle could be I'm going to hurt I'm no I'm going to Ralph almost said hurl I'm going <laughs> to Ralph <laughs> I mean we should at least put together the trailer would you like tubular I'm going to Ralph <laughs> dead man's chunks <laughs> this summer things are heating up on the WB <laughs> in a world yeah in a world where <laughs> ice does exist <laughs> Oh, this is so much fun. I'm loving it. We ended up frozen for all these years. And then we come to life, come back to life like Austin Powers. That could be the <laughs> curse the witches put on you. They put you in like a cryo, whatever they, <laughs> they froze you. <laughs> we come back, but somehow we've aged. <laughs> oh, my gosh. There's so many possibilities, Hollywood. Come on. I know. I think we just have to write it ourselves. That's how it gets done. <laughs> so... <laughs> I imagine that you're often asked to comment on the the topic of bullying. Yep, we have for sure. I wonder first about that. You know, several of those around that time period of your characters are, are that type of character. So I wonder when the first role that you played that was completely opposite of that was and how that felt to have something that's, you know, not so childish and bullying and you know, a a completely different kind of character? That's a good question because I, you know, I have portrayed other, you know, next door guy, you know, the neighbor or like in Walk the Line, I was, I played one of the band members, but, you know, good old American, good old country boy, mechanic, simpleton, Mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of times just because I I guess I look this way, you know, I, I, I end up having a twang or, (laughs) <laughs> I think also because <laughs> I sing country music, there's also that natural kind of thing that happens. And, and uh, my mom grew up a lot, partly in West Virginia. My grandpa was a coal miner. So I have that Southern side and my dad was uh, mostly Los Angeles. And that's where we mostly grew up. But, you know, I always enjoy playing the bad guy because there can be some depth, you know, to that. Cause you got to kind of understand like you're only as bad as you are good or understand goodness you know Mm -hmm. and so if you can find that real place and humanize the villain which there's a lot of great actors that have done that and those kind of roles where you love to 
Yeah. You kind of love to hate the villain, but you kind of feel for him because you know something happened along the way that messed them up, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, made them made them angry or made them turn. And a lot of times it's just the way the parent or the grandfather or whoever raised them was and treated them or what they watched growing up, you know, I mean, not to get too personal. My, my dad was just a, a saint, but he came from a kind of a rough background. Like his dad was an alcoholic and um, his mom worked hard, but there was a lot of domestic violence and he kind of ran, ran and hid from that when he could. And, uh, you know, he turned it around for us. So there's always that turnaround point. It, it, it can happen if somebody chooses. Otherwise, if we just kind of do what our parents did, I don't, I don't think there'd be a lot of progress in people's lives or at least their independence. Right. Mm-hmm. But I'm trying to think the first role where I kind of played just, I guess it was just, you know, I, it, it's almost extreme because I remember playing while I was shooting a lot of these bully type roles. I played on a show called Great Scott. Um, it was Toby Maguire's first break in TV in anything, I think, uh, outside of commercials or, you know, small appearances on shows. And it, it lasted, I played a choir geek and I love music and I'm, and I grew up singing and doing choir and I did drama. And uh-huh. so that was a lot of fun because I just played this overexcited, like guy, the choir nerd, the leader of the, uh, the pack. And I had my two buddies and we'd go around singing all day long. And so we had all these little musical jingles that we sang and Toby, we're trying to get him to join the choir and he's just so like not into it. (laughs) Oh, here's an interesting something that I just, when I was watching, I told you, I I went back through this quarantine and the time we've had, I've been watching some of my old clips and reels and I found that episode and we're in a pancake house and we start singing like Little Scotty Melrod loves pancakes and syrup and chocolate too. And we're doing three part and he's just so embarrassed. And he looks up and he sees his girl, the girl that he likes and the girl that he likes was portrayed. And I didn't know this. I don't know if she knows this, but by Vanessa Shaw. So I looked up, I'm like, Vanessa was in that scene that I, because we didn't shoot. I don't think on the same, it was like they shot her the other way later. And he looks over and he's so embarrassed because she's a cool girl and he's singing in this choir singing, you know, in the middle of IHOP or whatever. Uh huh. So I thought that was kind of, oh my gosh, that's Vanessa. Seven degrees of hocus pocus. (laughs) (laughs) Remind me, I'm going to make a note of that to tell her that next time I talk to her. That's funny. But yeah, that was fun, you know, definitely very different than the bully. But it seems like, you know, just the way, I guess the way I carry myself, I'm a big guy. I probably can be intimidating uh, without trying. <laughs> and so a lot of the roles that I'll play uh, and I continue to play are still, um, you know, can be villains in some way. Or, Does it ever offend you or hurt your feelings? No, I made a living being a villain <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and it's not who I am. You know, I, I definitely try not to be that kind of person, but it's, it's fun. It's really, it's fun to play those roles. Of course, I'm always looking for something different and to expand my abilities. And I've, I've been able to play some kind of like, you know, everyday man type roles and some leading roles in films. And I played not too long ago, um, principal in a school, uh, but it was, the show is called Dwight and Shining Armor. It's on the BYU channel. It's actually a pretty, pretty fun little show. It's basically kind of a, almost like a Buffy the, the Vampire Slayer thing. The girl comes back with a wizard into modern day with a kid that just goes to the school and he's the prince and they ha- have to fight off all these real villains that appear in the school. And I just played a, like a regular principal that, you know, just teaching the kids and mm-hmm. it was fun. It was, yeah. you know, a lot of people kind of compare me some type thing to John Goodman type uh-huh. stuff as I've gotten older, just character roles, you know, cowboys or yeah, weird guys or <laughs> Dudes that like to bowl and cuss. <laughs> yeah. But it seems like those are fun. <laughs> you know, they're a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I, I enjoy, enjoy the process. And, and then, you know, I like to break it up with the, with the music stuff. I think, you know, you had mentioned um, that music's still my, 
primary passion. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of become, you know, it's, it's a passion like acting. They're all, it's all art, you know, as I've gotten more into it, it's just fun to be creative, whether it's writing a song or getting on a stage and entertaining or playing a role or, you know, whether it's film TV or like musical theater. I love that too. Yeah. It's just, I like to work or be at least have my head in something working towards something. If not, I can, I find myself, you know, sometimes in a, in a depression and I'm like, what's wrong? Oh, yeah. you're not creating, you're not being proactive. And that's important. Do you ever, um, not in a music kind of sense, but do you ever write? Like uh, screen writing? Or, yeah. Or that, or just any or kind just of writing. writing. Yeah. I journaled for a long time in my life. Um, I've started to do some of that again. I did comedy um, on and off through my career. There was a time where I was really like focused on that and uh, doing all the open mics and uh-huh. kind of starting to, to get somewhere, but found it was really just challenging in a way that I didn't, I didn't want to pursue in that way anymore. Um, but as I've gotten older, I have a lot of screenplay ideas. I have a lot of uh, just comedy things that come to mind. I'll, I'll write down and, me and some of my friends growing up, we always had a video camera. I don't know if you saw that Val documentary yet on Val Kilmer. No, no. Um, or the 90s Punky Brewster thing. Did you see that one? That's the one I thought you were going to say, but no, I haven't seen the Val one. Same idea where he yeah. had a camera like, and he was always filming him. His brothers made stupid movies. and But I, I also always had a camera. Yeah. And in fact, we've got great behind the scenes footage of from Hocus Pocus. If you remind me, I'll send you some clips that will probably blow your mind. It's Stop just it. Will you us. please? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and that's interesting that you're that same generation, that exact generation of kids yeah. that had the video camera and in Hollywood. And that's interesting. It was what, you know, it kept us out of trouble in so many ways because we would get together and our entertainment was making movies and doing sketches and just recording stuff you know, mm-hmm. i got before track very early on and we were always experimenting or doing you know what now i think people are doing podcasts and doing all these little sketches and, and yeah. stuff i've we've got quite a bit of stuff and I, i'm inspired lately to go back through and maybe start putting a timeline together and maybe share you know a little bit of my documentary of a young actor in hollywood and growing up through the 90s and some of the experiences that i I've had and learned um, my cousin and I were always big dreamers together. He he's finally ha- hitting his stride with uh, filmmaking and he's always been a screenwriter and director. And I was, you know, the actor side of it. And, and I loved cinematography too. That was the mm-hmm. other thing I love still. But anyway, he's finally got a deal got recognized by Mel Gibson and him and Mel um, finished a script, a rewrite of the wild bunch. Mm an old 60s western and that's been greenlit some big wigs in that and it's so it's exciting to see you know and talk about how remember when we talked about our dreams now Uh things are it's being realized on both sides so it'll be fun when we get to work together in that capacity again which i think will happen soon i had a cousin when i was i want to say we were like in fifth sixth grade we were sitting in art class And I don't know why in art class, but we determined, and I'm not even that close to this cousin now. I'm really not sure what he's doing, but we determined that when we were adults, we were going to create a candy store, an old style candy store, like, you know, with the jars on the wall and everything. And it was like, that's what we're going to (laughs) do. That's so cool. That's amazing. (laughs) How funny is that? I want the candy. I want the candy, free candy. Yeah. Did you ever do it? No, not, no. I mean, um, it's not too late. I remember getting so nerdy about it, though, probably around the same time that we did like some designs and some like sketches of <laughs> what we wanted it to look like. I was very insistent that it was going to be like old fashioned, you know, Victorian kind of it was going to be super cool. But, you know, life changes. <laughs> and then when you're in middle school, life changes really quick. You change oh, every yeah. day. <laughs> Yeah, and it's and it's interesting though. 
those dreams though sometimes get us to the to that next place wherever that is uh-huh. you know so it's like at least as long as you're shooting for mm-hmm. where they say shoot for the shoot for the, the stars and maybe you'll hit the moon or yeah. something along those lines well that cousin is now a barber so hey it's a well, little different <laughs> <laughs> maybe they maybe maybe he can have candy uh right there in the bar and maybe shop. he does i don't know i'm gonna have to reach out and ask him i haven't talked yeah. to him in a long time so you know i just want my audience to know that you mm. volunteered you you know suggested that maybe you could sing a song for us and yeah i wish you could have seen my face everybody when he suggested <laughs> this because i was uh, I almost considered asking you if there was a, a recording or something that we could include, but having you sing just right here, you've got a nice microphone, you've got your instrument with you. And I think we might be able to do this before we do that, though, because I'm super pumped about that. Before we do that, I want you to have the opportunity to talk about any upcoming projects you've got going on. Anything that you want to promote, if you're um, open to people reaching out, you know, fill us in on anything coming up. Okay. Well, I just did this really cool podcast with um, this show called The Big Se- Seance. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Isn't, isn't that what you told me to say? <laughs> <laughs> No, Checks honestly, you guys mail. have to check. You guys have to first of all check out this guy's podcast. I was asked to do this, but I listened to the one just before, and I'm now I'm a fan. I like the way you approached it. Great questions, interesting topics, and I, I can tell you're very passionate about about it. And you do your homework, so that's awesome. So check that out. If you want to hear more hocus pocus stuff, you can hear that just by going back before the one you're listening to now and listen to David Kirshner, the executive producer of the hoax pokes, the man behind the whole vision. Right. Mm-hmm. And then I, I won't mention who else you might have. Cause I don't know where you're at with that, but <laughs> he will probably have some other hocus pocus folks. I'm hoping I'm crossing um, my fingers. He is hunting. He is ho- hocus pocusing. And then in my world, you can go to my website at, we're working on updating it. We've been a little lazy around these parts. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think the whole world is uh, taking a little break. So it's like you see these uh, these signs off the freeway. You're like, oh, Tim McGraw's coming to. Oh, that was last year. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't replaced it because there's nothing else planned yet. Um, <clears throat> so make sure you check the year <laughs> that you're looking right. at before you go to that show. Um <laughs> But um, you can go to my website, which is just my name, um, Larry Bagby. If you don't know how to spell Larry, then uh, yeah, you're on your own there. But um, <laughs> Bagby is B-A-G-B-Y, like a bag and then B-Y. Uh, LarryBagby.com. I'm also on all the social media platforms. Uh, Instagram is just my handles, Larry Bagby. Uh, and Twitter's at Larry Bagby and Facebook. I have a lot of friends on my, you know, the one, the 5,000 that you can only have. And that I just didn't do the fan page soon enough. And so people think that I'm not confirming them as friends, but my page is full. So I have to like get rid of people if I want to add. So if that's the case, if you guys go to Larry Bagby music, Facebook, it's at Larry Bagby music and you can follow me there. And then you can try my other page and I'll decide if I want to, lose a, an old friend for a new one no <laughs> pressure you gotta no be pressure. really good no pressure. you gotta be really <laughs> cool or really hot you gotta be whatever. really tubular tubular exactly and no dead man's chungs <laughs> um because <laughs> i'm gonna ralph right the there you go we got all we got all the the things covered and how many times i gotta tell you my name ain't larry no more it's ernie no <laughs> ice oh never mind it's ice so that's that's happening. I will tell you, I I worked on a show last year that it was the final season of the show. I did a two part episode on a show called Dwight in Shining Armor. Really fun show on the BYU channel. It'll probably be available in other Paramount type distribution network things going on. And I did a movie with Mark Wahlberg uh, where I 
at least a couple of scenes there with him. We'll see what ends up in the movie, but mm-hmm. that was cool. That was real recently. Great guy. Cool, fun film. I think it'll be a cool film called Father Stew. Be on the lookout for that. Um, also working on a new album, but I've got this album here. And maybe um, if somebody, maybe we, I could send you a few and you can, you know, give them as a gift to some one of some of your podcast listeners or something. Okay. If you give me an address, I'll do that. How cool would that be? Uh, we put together what's called the Essentials, Larry Bagby, and it's it's a it's a compilation album of songs that kind of my most popular songs over the years, and songs that I really like that we've done. There's uh, 18 tracks, and that's that. And sir, I have to tell you, if you do, you know, go back into your archives of like video and you come up with something, I want to follow up on that. I want to hear about it. I think that's super cool. Okay, for sure. Yeah, we've, we digitized uh, a whole, at least one of the videotapes and they use some of it for that Hocus Pocus reunion, just a couple clips. Oh, okay. But there's some stuff I I can send you that. Yeah. I think you would get a kick out of because it's, it's me and my camera and us. I even had my parents or somebody's parents filming uh-huh. while we were doing our scenes. So you have Kenny directing us. Shut up. All of our scenes. I don't know how I managed to get away with it. There is a clip too that I got caught. Um, I remember I heard earlier today when I was listening to David talking about Tower Records uh-huh. and he had drawn this Sleeping with the Stars uh-huh. thing with Pat Midler. He has this picture. Uh huh. And he's like, I don't know why I wouldn't think that there would be, you know, I need permission or copyrights or similar thing happened where I had the camera on set when they were doing, you know, we'd done our scenes up in the cages and we we're waiting to film some more. And we were just down while they're doing like their little potion thing. And, and I'm filming and I see Bette Midler catch cameras like lens and I'm there behind it. And she's like, what is, what is this? And you see her like smirk. And then Kenny's like, who's got the camera? I go, that's me. Kenny's like, you can't film. Cause she thought it was like extra or something <gasps> like that. You were no in permission. trouble, dude. I got in trouble. And I've got her just being like, <laughs> I was like so scared. Cause she was in her, witch. I mean, that kind of like helped me later when we were acting. Cause I was a little bit nervous. <laughs> ben but, was uh, being a Karen. He was being <laughs> before Karens were a thing. <laughs> yeah. You don't look her in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun. Anyway, I've got that footage. So remind me and I will, I'll follow through with you on that. All right. Should we do a little tune? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. This is a song I wrote uh, a few years back. It became the title track of the album I wrote a few years back, like I said. Um, I wrote it with a friend of mine that I went to high school with that writes with me now quite a bit, Mr. Peter Fox. And um, it kind of tells my story, my country laid back kind of way. Corn-fed hometown. California boy, love the ocean and the sunshine, waves settle me to joy. Mom's from West Virginia, daddy's from LA, wear a cowboy hat, designer jeans, and that laid back southern way. When I didn't go to college, study philosophy, my music through the faith. How he speaks to me Don't have no certificate Of what I am to be I've got a genuine degree Sing country by the sea Does it sound all right? Send my sails away from stormy seas. Singer and songwriter found what I want to be. On my way down the path I've always known. 
Winds they turn from north to south, red carpets to the roads. Well, I didn't go to college, study philosophy. Well, I didn't go to college, I study philosophy. My music through the faith is how he speaks to me. Don't have no certificate of what I am to be. I've got a genuine degree. Sing country by the sea is for compassion. Sea is for charity. Well, sea is for the center, the core of you and me. Well, love is what connects us from heaven to earth and sea is for the man who died for you and me. Well, he didn't go to college, study philosophy, the music through the faith. How he speaks to me Don't have no certificate What you get is what you see I got a genuine degree Middle C is my philosophy I recorded this here record for you and me Sing country by the by the sea i'm larry bagby oh my god that modulation into that bridge dude <laughs> hey you know your music you just said it right you knew exactly o- what that was m g bridge baby that's my favorite part of the song and i find i find a lot of times that's kind of the best part of my songs i don't know I wish I could write everything else as good as my bridge. You're a master of the bridges. I am a bridge maker, not a bridge burner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to play bridge, but I certainly can sing one. Anyway. If you are one of my supporters on Patreon, you'll find bonus audio of Larry and I after the interview some more music, and we talk about the funny moment at the end of the film where Ice and Jay sing Row, Row, Row Your Boat. So you'll find that at patreon.com slash big seance. Thank you to the following super para nerds who support the show at patreon.com slash big seance. Daryl, James Deacon, Genesis, Natalie N., Kim Robb, Josiah Lorenzo, Susan Davey, and Amy Park Gedeke. My supporters at the parlor guest level, who can be found at bigseance.com slash parlor guests, are Linda of shimmeringmoons.com, Anne Rekovich of ozparatech.com, Denise Sia of Raven Haunts Paranormal, Janae Michaels of Grey House Tarot and Farm Artifacts, Chelsea from Cheers with Chelsea, Sarita Cockerham, Christine Rath Selhi, Mitchell Coombs, Christine Ferens, Mindy Kintop, Hope Battaglia, Cassie Keller, Melissa Armour, Diane Rax, Nettie, Dina DeCastro of Dina DeCastro Astrology, 
Bruce Williams, Christopher Kohler, Lena and John of Carbon Lilies, Jim Budd, David Rubenstein, and Norman and Linda Keller. That sound you just heard was the above and beyond there's not even a category for your level of support fireworks display. Because I have six awesome listeners who continue to support the show at the $10 level. Peggy Hagen, Glenna Becker, Steve Skinner, Kevin Gilbert, AJ Meredith, and James Wilfong. So thank you, Peggy, Glenna, Steve, Kevin, AJ, and James and thank you, Paranerds. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit bigseance.com. And you can continue the discussion and hang out with a great community of Paranerds by joining us in the Big Seance Parlor on Facebook. Want to hear your voice in a future episode? Go to bigseance.com slash feedback to learn how. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out, but we'll see you and light them again next time. 